and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. I'm Aaron Porras, here with ILTV's Morning Briefing. Prime Minister Netanyahu has just finished the final leg of his European tour in the United Kingdom, where he's met with British Prime Minister Theresa May. Though May acknowledges that she and Netanyahu have different opinions when it comes to the nuclear deal with Iran, the two leaders have recognized the overall threat Iran poses in the region. But perhaps the biggest talking point of the day wasn't nuclear warheads or Iran but rather the recent turmoil along the Gaza border. Just like Merkel and Macron before her, May voiced deep concerns for the nearly 120 Palestinians killed in recent border clashes by Israeli soldiers. Though Israel has defended its use of lethal force in those rallies, the international community has largely condemned Israel for the deaths. Despite the fact that at least half of those killed were in fact Hamas terrorists, other fatalities included Palestinian teenagers, journalists, and most recently a female volunteer medic. Israel has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing in any of these incidents, however. Now, as for the nuclear deal, the British Prime Minister says the United Kingdom remains committed to the deal with Iran so long as Iran holds up its ends of the bargain. But now that United States President Donald Trump has withdrawn America from the agreement, the entire deal is in jeopardy anyhow, and gives Iran leverage to renegotiate more favorable terms. And if the agreement fails altogether, Iran has declared that it will resume developing nuclear warheads immediately. The regime has already opened a new nuclear facility for centrifuge production. This in itself doesn't violate the terms of the deal, but it demonstrates Iran's willingness to approach the red line and cross it if necessary. Former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani was in Israel yesterday, speaking at the Tel Aviv Globe's Capital Market Conference. Though this conference is mostly designed as an international business get-together for industry market leaders, Giuliani's speech took a decidedly political turn. The attorney for United States President Donald Trump told the crowd that a team of Democrats were conspiring with special counsel Robert Mueller to frame the president using the ongoing probe into possible collusions with Russia. Giuliani also took time to mention his admiration for Prime Minister Netanyahu, calling the corruption allegations against him a joke. Netanyahu has repeatedly been questioned as a suspect in a number of graft scandals. One alleges that he received illicit gifts from billionaire friends, Two others allege that Netanyahu made deals with newspapers to gain favorable coverage in exchange for advancing political benefits or agreeing to crush one of the paper's rival publications. Giuliani directly addressed these allegations, telling the crowd, quote, When I was mayor of New York, I offered jobs to people who supported me. You do favors for people who supported you in politics. End quote. Giuliani's increasingly public role as Trump's attorney has often put him in hot water too, though, sometimes even with the very man he's defending. And at this time, Mueller's team has served several former members of Team Trump, including former campaign chairman Paul Manafort, with criminal charges. During arrest raids on Wednesday in the Palestinian village of Nabi Saleh, IDF soldiers were met with a group who attempted to disrupt the arrests and threw stones. The targets for the arrests are suspects for terror-related crimes, but when one stone struck a soldier in the head, the IDF responded to the group with live fire, reportedly killing 21-year-old Ez Eldin Al-Tamimi. According to the Palestinian Information Ministry, however, the IDF killed Tamimi in cold blood. Then later in Nablus, in the early morning hours Thursday, riots broke out during another arrest raid. Stones and cement blocks were thrown at the soldiers who again responded with some live fire and other crowd dispersal methods. Another soldier was slightly injured during this conflict and was treated at the scene. Despite the episode, the IDF still reportedly made 11 arrests and seized thousands of shackles that belonged to Hamas in the West Bank. 24 hours after Argentina called off its friendly soccer match in Israel, the accusations are already flying. What's clear is that the decision to move the game from Haifa to Jerusalem sparked the controversy that ultimately led Argentina to cancel. But for now, what isn't clear yet is who exactly demanded the move in the first place. Culture and Sports Minister Miri Regev has taken most of the heat for the game's collapse so far. Regev herself stresses that threats from Palestinians against team players is the only reason the match was called off. But her culture ministry is now under an internal probe after it was revealed that only a third of the 30,000 tickets were actually put up for sale. The other 20,000 tickets were apparently earmarked for government staffers, NGOs, and ministry officials. On top of this, reports say that Regev herself put up the ministry's money to move the game to Jerusalem in exchange for a photo op with the superstar player Lionel Messi on the field before the match. Yesterday, however, Regev told reporters that Prime Minister Netanyahu personally requested the game be moved to Jerusalem in the first place. At that very moment in the United Kingdom, Netanyahu was telling reporters the opposite, that Regev originally asked for the move. 
a copy of a letter to Argentina's President Mauricio Macri notifying Argentina of the move soon then surfaced on Israeli television. The signature at the bottom bears Netanyahu's name. Palestinians revolted when Israel announced the Jerusalem move accusing the administration of politicizing sports during an especially volatile time in the region. Reports say Messi did indeed receive death threats, however, if he were to play in Jerusalem. But at the end of the day, most see it as a tragedy that the game fell apart in the first place. A truly disappointing missed opportunity that could have gone the other way and brought together both sides through a common love. Israel-based genealogy company MyHeritage revealed in a statement Monday that 92 million user emails were stolen in a breach from October of last year. With a massive cache of records across 42 languages, including DNA records, historical documents, census, immigration, marriage, and burial certificates, it makes sense that MyHeritage is a target for cyber attacks. Thankfully, MyHeritage knows that too, though, and it seems to have avoided any real damage from the breach. The company discovered the attack on Monday after a file containing the user email addresses and hashed passwords was tracked back to a private server. And while hash encryption isn't foolproof, it's a good start, and MyHeritage security doesn't end there. The rest of the user information is fragmented and either kept in unrelated systems or not kept at all. Family trees and DNA are stored in their own system with extra security. Email addresses are on a different system. Credit card data isn't kept at all and is rather stored on servers of third-party vendors. Thanks to these measures and others, MyHeritage reportedly hasn't seen any evidence that the stolen data has been used. And further, the relevant authorities and response teams have all been organized to avoid it from happening in the first place from now on. That's all for now. I'm Aaron Porras, and see you later with our main daily broadcast from Israel at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. <laughs>